as requested, uh, the fly that we're going to tie tonight is an October Caddis, a stimulator version. But so you already know how to tie a stimulator. We're going to show you a way to tie it a little different than probably many of you are doing on them. Usually we find that people tend to use their rotary vice to look at the other side of the fly. And that's just about how much it gets used. And the rotational features are actually quite quite great. So I asked two questions and don't answer them to me, just answer them within your own heart. Do you have an inline rotational vice, number one? And number two, do you use it for more than looking at the other side of the fly? Or even if that? Well, we're gonna show you a little bit more about that. But first, let's take a look at the recipe. And the curved, uh, the hook tonight is a curved nymph hook. It's uh, often referred to as a TMCO 200R or similar. Uh, very frankly, let's come back to that hook in a minute. I want to talk to you about it for a bit. <clears throat> but anyway, the thread will be a Danville uh, 6 old brown or whatever color you want and whatever, whatever size you want. The tail and the wing both are deer or elk hair stacked and uh, about the length of the gap on the tail. And we bring the wing out to the end of the tail when we get to that. Hackle is grizzly or whatever you want. This is again, this is kind of a modified version that I've done uh, with orange body dubbing. And again, the wing is uh, length is out to the end of the tail and the head is orange dubbing with grizzly hackle. Now let's go back to that nymph hook. <clears throat> I'm tying it on what the originator tied it on in his book. And it was, a, I think it's credited with Randall Kaufman. However, I've had other people tell me that it was their pattern as well. It don't make any difference that he's the first one to publish it anyway that I know about. This is kind of like the, the goal at the end of the at the end of the road that we'll be traveling. And this is the stimulator that we'll be tying. I think everybody can probably see that just fine. We're going to talk about hair though. Okay? Hair is really important and it's using the correct hair. Now you might ask yourself, well, isn't deer hair deer hair? And that's in fact what I tied this one out of. However, you can use elk. And the rules that we'll talk about regarding hair are the same. We found if you use hair that's along the backbone of the of the animal, you know, a six inch strip along the backbone is the best for wings and tails on humpies, wolf, trudes, stimulators, etc. Because it doesn't have quite as much flare. Let me show you right here. It's just the wing and tail that I put on a hook. It's um. You can see that it, it holds its shape pretty well. Let me uh, let me back up a little bit on the on my camera. There we go. You can see that it holds the profile of the wing fairly well. On the other hand, though, here's one that's tied out of belly hair. And if you like your flies to look this way, it's absolutely okay to use that. I mean, it's uh, it's great. You're probably a better tire than I am because I struggled for the better part of 15 minutes to make this one look as good as it does right there. So we'll set that aside and we're gonna talk about selecting that hair. And Gretchen, would you go to a screen share and we're gonna run a video about selecting hair. We're looking at a hide that's currently for sale at Moscow Hide and Fur. That's in Moscow, Idaho, but it's a website, Moscow Hide and Fur. It's a white tail. I want you to notice the dark strip down the backbone right along there. We're going to be talking about that right now as I move into this next piece of hair. Let me lay this picture down and grab this piece of hair right here. We looked at it last week and we're going to look at it closer this week. Notice that all the light colored hair along here and as it gets darker over here. Well that hair, this hair here is close to the backbone and this is close to the flank. In fact you can see flank hair right here. The hair that you want for humpies and wolves is the dark hair on a six inch strip down the backbone. Now this is just a little bit off of the backbone right here. It's good for old caddis and stuff like that, but the humpies and wolf stuff is off the backbone. And I have another piece of hair for you to look at right here. This is off the backbone of the animal. And I want you to notice how much darker it is. It's dark all the way through the strand. And uh, that's the stuff that you want. That's perfect for wolves and humpies. Now let's now let's go to the materials. We're on the materials. Okay, the most important thing about tying with hair is if you're not using static guard, you are one frustrated individual. 
It uh, eliminates static electricity. And I cannot tell you the number of people that have told me that they uh, uh, just can't tie. The, the hair that they bought is, is no good. It sticks to everything. It sticks to them. It won't stack in the stacker. If that sounds familiar, there's a good chance it's not the hair that's in trouble. It's the fact that you need to get rid of the static electricity. Very, very important. So it's a very inexpensive item at the, at the grocery store. It's in the laundry detergent aisle. So that's where you want to go. The other things we're going to be using is stimulator hooks. We already talked about those. Orange dubbing and some grizzly hackle and uh, deer hair. You can tell it's really nice and dark from uh, along the backbone. We'll, we'll be getting to that in just a minute. I want you to notice that I'm setting this hook in the bison, even though it doesn't have a straight shank, I'm setting it so that most of the straight part of the shank stays pretty much on axis when I rotate the hook. Yeah, everything else is swapping around, but you'll see why we're doing that here in just a moment. Now I'll get out some, uh, it said in the recipe I was going to use brown, but quite frankly, oh, there's my brown. I, I laid it down and forgot that I laid it down somewhere else. So anyway, we'll I'll get the brown thread out here. Can you go lie down now? Okay. Let's go back to me for a second, Gretchen. This happens all the time. I've got a, um, a sp spool of thread in my bobbin, and the doggone stuff is sticky. It just doesn't want to quite want to come out, and it may, might even break. Well, there's a real handy way to fix that for you. It's called your nose. Grease it up, and let's go to work. Okay, let's go back to the vice, Gretchen. I'm going to start my thread now about one-third back on the hook shank from the front. And we do not want to go any further forward than that. Gretchen and I always use our thread to mark our starting and stopping points on, on things. And I want you to notice I stopped that at the end of the shank. And where's the end of the shank on this curved hook? It's where the thread hangs straight down in line with the throat of the barb of the hook. The throat of the barb is a little V-notch back in, back in there. You probably can't see it. Maybe, yeah, maybe you can see it. move the camera forward just a little bit. You can yeah. see that. OK, I'm going to wrap this back forward. And I'm going to reach over here and get some of this, just a, a clump of that deer hair that we looked at a minute ago. And we're going to clean out the under fur, get rid of that. It's all that fuzzy stuff right here. And I'm going to quickly run my figure up and down through the base ends. They're knocking that out. I don't want to pull it out because it'll cause static electricity. And I just use static guard to try to get rid of that. So we don't want to pull it out. We want to quickly do that routine, but it makes a mess all over everything. So I want to move off camera and do it over the wastebasket. Okay, and now all that stuff is gone. Of course, now it's sticking to my lights. So <laughs> great. <clears throat> and we'll get a hair stacker out here. I always put the hair in my stacker backwards. And why is that? I want you to notice that the trim butts are all even, but if I try to put that into my stacker, this way, all those unstacked ends, they, there's only about three or four of all the bunch that's going to end up in the stacker. But I can keep everything under control this way. Back them in there, then go ahead and stack it. And you notice that my stacker probably isn't the same as the one you bought at the store. This is a shotgun shell and a chapstick. And I, I've been using it for 30 years and it's, it's kind of like an old buddy. I don't want to change. It's so pretty. Yes, it's <laughs> the the one that I made for my tank. It's a lot prettier because it's not hasn't been used quite as much. Actually, when when we're commercial tying, I've got twenty four of these, uh, twelve tails and twelve wings, is is what it's all for. Uh, we're going to get rid of some of this uh, some of this hair. Got a little bit too much there. What I like to have is uh, okay. Notice I'm kind of bunching that all together in my fingers, and then I pinch it once, and I want it to be about the width of the gap of the hook. If it's bigger than that, got a problem. If it's smaller than that, not near the problem. But I'm gonna set that in place, and we're gonna talk about, let me, let me do something else for a minute, just a sec. Let's get clear out on the end here. A lot of people get themselves in trouble when they try to tie the hair on the hook. And here's what happens, it flares all over the place, and then they try to start wrapping back and they keep snagging the hair and just a heck of a mess. I'm going to show you a little trick. Let me back up here. Get this back up. Now let's remeasure that tail. 
I want the tail to be about as long as the gap of the hook, sticking out over the end. Now, what I don't want to do is use real tight wraps to start, just snug. You see that hair did not flare back and get in the way of my fingers to go to the next, to the next turn. Now I'm going to go to the next turns back, working my way towards the back of the hook. And here's where I really wail into it. I really crank into that baby. And the softer wraps in front of it keeps the hair out of my way. So now we'll just start wrapping towards the, towards the bend of the hook or the end of the shank. We're in the bend of the hook almost from the start, but end of the shank there and back forward. I like my tail to flare a little bit. We're going to uh, trim off the waist. Now, remember that hair that just only had soft wraps on it? Now I wrap over it with tight wraps. So it's all anchored down the same. All right, let's get one of those pieces of, of grizzly hackle. You might go to notice, I went to all the trouble of putting it in a hackle plier so I could pick it up real easy and drop it into my trash bin while we were talking. That's just goes to show you that things don't always work out the way you had it planned. Okay, we'll strip off the, the, the waist ends right there at the, at the end of the stem and wrap that in place. <clears throat> and up to this point, you're saying, well, I thought Al was gonna show us something different. Well, from here, it starts to get a little bit different. Let me dig out my gubbing wax. That's the, the tacky, uh, Beatty's tacky dubbing wax. And I'm gonna back the camera up a little bit so you can see kind of how I'm going about dubbing. <clears throat> we'll get the wax out here. And before we use the wax in the, on, on the thread, I want you to notice that I have that wax turned up just so it barely peeks up above the edge of the tube. Too often people crank that wax up so they think in their mind that, well, I, I want that thread to be really sticky. And they, uh, they end up making a globbed up mess on their, on their thread. And you don't want a bunch of clumps of, of wax. You only want sticky thread. And that's what I have right now is wax thread and it's sticky. Now I'm gonna put the cap back on this wax before I get anything else. How many times have you dropped your wax in the trash bin with the cap off? Not a pretty sight. All right, let me get to some dubbing out here. This is some soft touch dubbing. It's um, a natural dubbing that we manufacture. And if you're familiar with uh, muskrat belly fur, this is the same thing as. And I'm just gonna see, I'm just kind of touching that to the thread. And that sticky wax just grabs as much as I need. Too many, too many people overdress their, their, their thread with too much dubbing. And uh, our motto is less is always better. Anyway, so now I'm gonna start wrapping from the front of the body towards the back. Well, okay, he's still doing the same darn thing as he was before, you're probably saying to yourself, he's wrapping around the hook. Well, I can also rotate the vise to, to attach that dubbing. Well, I can also wrap and rotate at the same time, speeding up the process and checking the other side of the hook to make sure that I haven't missed the spot. Missed the spot. Well, let's pull out another chunk of dubbing. I don't have quite enough there to finish the body. <clears throat> and another way to dub, it's, it's outlined in our book, a dozen dubbing techniques, is uh, just pull, pulling the bit off and twisting it on. And uh, again, too often people put way too much on. Well, that'll be just about enough. So I'm going to go ahead and continue wrapping and rotating the vise at the same time. Whoops at the same time, but I want you to notice something. You see how that's kind of balled up there? The difference that the wax thread makes in the dubbing application, I don't like that. I'm gonna get my wax back out and we'll do a nice even consistent ply instead of <clears throat> that up, would you please? I did exactly what I told you I didn't want to do. I knocked the cap of the dubbing wax into the trash bin. So Gretchen's cleaning that up for me while I'm doing the next step here now. I could have just kept quiet and not said anything, but you got to know that things on, on live, um, on the internet, don't always go the way you want, just like it does in real life. Okay, let's 
Now let's continue to wrap and wind until we get to the back of the hook. Now we're at the point where I've brought the thread back to meet the hackle. And I'm going to advance the two together <clears throat> with the idea of um, tying it off when I get to the front. So I'm just gonna hold the two and I want you to notice that I put the thread in front of the, of the hackle, that's kind of important. And I'm gonna start wrapping forward. And when we get up to the front, we'll stop. And we can just go ahead and tie this off. Or there's another little trick that I'm gonna share with you right now. Let me unwrap all this. All right. We call this the drop tie off. And there's a couple of ways to do it. You'll see a couple of them tonight. I'm gonna start out. Now I'm not flipping you guys off, but that finger right there is gonna hold the thread. You've got, you've got your tail messed up. Oh, got it. Thanks, Gretchen. Yeah, there you go. All right, there. <clears throat> That's the bobbin rest or the thread rest, my uh, second finger. And then I'm gonna take and hold the feather with the other two. Well, you can't see what's going on, but I give it a little twist and you can see that the thread's behind the, the, the feather. Now let me advance it forward. And when we get up to the point where we want to tie off the feather, I stop so you can see what I'm doing. I drop that off my finger, hang on to the feather and wrap two more turns forward. And I tie it off the feather. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that one more time for you. And we're gonna hold the feather a little differently. All right, let's wind that up. <clears throat> now this time, I'm gonna hold the thread down here with my second finger and I'll hold the feather up above. So I think you might be able to see this a little bit better. And I'll just start wrapping back until I get to the tie off point, drop the, the thread, two more turns and I'm done. I'll pull that back out of the way here, anchor it in place and just put it back in my, in my material keeper. Now I'm just gonna trim off across the top. We don't need that in the wing and I'll get some, some hair out for the wing. <clears throat> and I'll just, again, I'm just running through this real fast with my finger to uh, get rid of the under fur. Okay, good. Oh, got a little bit of under fur that didn't come out. And now I'll uh, place it in my stacker. Always take the hair out of your stacker pointing in the direction you're gonna use it. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but how many times have you seen someone tying flies and they say, oh, that's gonna be a wing on a wolf and they do this and then they turn it around and end up misaligning it before they go to tie it on when they really needed to take it out of the stacker pointing in that direction. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and restack this because I didn't mess it up in explaining to you, but just be sure to take the hair out of the stacker in the direction that it's gonna go on the hook. Tails and crude wings, wings for humpies and wolves. <clears throat> All right, now let's get ready to tie this in place. <clears throat> I've got a few hairs that are a whole bunch shorter than the others. So I'm just gonna pull them out and set this in place. So it's measured even with the end of the tail. Let me pull that hackle out of the way so you can better see it. And I wanna get ready and just wrap a, a couple of turns. And remember, I'm just gonna snug it up and now I'm gonna get the one right behind it and really bail into it. That, really tight wrap is called an anchor wrap. And what I'm gonna follow with now is that wing flares a little bit more than I want it to. Even though it's the backbone hair, it still will flare a little bit. I'm gonna wrap with looser wraps, not, no, let me not let's say snug, but not tight wraps. And those are called holding wraps. And you see how it's gathering that wing? 
You make uh, you can make your wing have just about any profile that you want. And now we're going to get up to this point right here. And here's another little trick in making your fly the wings stay on top a lot better and making your fly a lot more durable. And that's to pull up some of the hair and take a turn of thread in between, pull up some more, some more, and some more until you get in front and then trim it all off. That'll give you a nice hackle platform to wrap your hackle on. <clears throat> All right, how oh, is that? All right, now we're going to get out my my wax again. Thank you, Gretch. Gretchen so kindly fixed uh, my dubbing wax cap. <clears throat> and this time, I'll follow my own rules and put the cap on before I ever pick up the dubbing. Okay, and we're just going to touch that dubbing to the wax thread, twist it in place. You know, all that nose grease that I put on my, uh, my bobbin, it's now so doggone loose and, and moves so well that I almost have uh, having a problem with it being too loose. But anyway, that's all right. <clears throat> We're getting right to the front here. And I'm going to use a half hitch tool now to just throw a quick half hitch in here because we're going to talk about this for a minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Bobbin rests. We're going to talk about them. Whether you want one or not, uh, if you've got one, you might as well use it what we think is right anyway. And I'm going to swing this bobbin around. And I'm going to move my camera to the side so you can see the rest and the fly bowls at the same time going the wrong way. Here we go. All right. I think it lines up pretty well. What we're going to do now is most people use a bobbin rest as a thread rest. And what they do is they pull the thread out of the bobbin so that it'll stick out straight out in front, just like that. There it hangs. And they're going to do whatever they're going to do, wrap things and so forth. And then, oh, well, it's, now it's time to tie the feather off or whatever you're doing. You go to do it and the thread's so long that you have to crank it up so you can get it back to working length. Like I've got it right there. I like to have it about an inch, inch and a half, two inches, no more. But what you do is with this bobbin rest is rather than keep it up even with the hook eye, just drop it down below and turn it into a bobbin rest, not a thread rest. You don't have to pull anything out, pull it up to where you want it to be. You see how that's resting there? The thread's in line with the hook. And all I have to do now is rotate to finish my fly. But there's another way to do it. You probably knew that was coming. Let me get this bobbin rest out of the way. If you don't want the bobbin rest, there's another way to do the drop tie off that we talked about in the middle of the fly. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is we're going to get our feather ready to wrap. I'm going to take, lay my scissors down because I, they're going to be in the way of the finger that I need to hold this as a bobbin rest, just like that. And now I'm just going to wrap forward until I get to the front. And then I'm going to drop and make sure that I bring the feather forward so it can be captured and you've tied it off. Now let me move this um, fly back into the center of the, okay, let me get that bobbin rest out of the way. <clears throat> I'm going to just take a couple of turns there to anchor that feather. And let's talk about tying off a fly. I see an awful lot of guys get a fly up to this. No, let me rephrase that. An awful lot of fly tires get it up to this point. My wife isn't a guy and she's a hell of a good fly tire. So I shouldn't say guys. I see an awful lot of people get the fly up to this point and thoroughly mess it up in the last two minutes they spend with it. And here's how you mess it up. Now this thought process goes through your mind. You say, well, I don't want that to come apart. Well, there's two turns of thread holding that feather in place. 
I better put some more on it. Number three, four, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16, 18, 20. That'll hold it. And then you cut off the feather. And then you got, oh, you got a big old piece of feather sticking up and a gobby head. So you got to cover that up. And you end up with a good looking fly, good wing, good hackle, and a big old gobby head. Well, let me back up here. There we go. Two turns of thread holding that feather in place. What I'm going to do now is pull the feather back and wrap a jam knot in front. Now remember, I've got two turns of thread going straight across the feather, right where my scissor points are. Now I'm gonna make the rest of the turns of thread in front, which builds a thread head and a jam knot. It also forms a dog leg in the stem of the feather that forces that back. So it turns mm, about a 45 degree angle and they don't pull out. Now don't trim that feather off yet. We'll talk about that. Now let's see. Going to uh, go ahead and apply a, a whip finish. And I want you to notice that my whip finish is starting back at the back end of the head of the head rather than up next to the eye. You see, an awful lot of people make this mistake is they'll the thread ends up at the front of the hook when they get through tying everything. And so they put a whip finish on that starts at the front and every turn, subsequent turn gets further back. And that's a mistake and I'll explain to you why. And in fact, I've got a YouTube video on our YouTube channel that explains in detail the difference between a good whip and a bad whip. The good whip has to start back on the head. If you start on the front and end up at the back, the last strand of thread doesn't go under the other turns, it lays on top. And you need to look at, look at that video to get that. But for now, we're just gonna go ahead and wrap this in place each subsequent turn, getting closer to the hook eye as I place those wraps. Now I've got five turns there and you won't really be able to see it, but it disappears right under those five turns. So it's a well-protected whip finish. It wouldn't be so well-protected if the last strand was laying over the top of those five turns. Now let's trim off this and let's talk about trimming that off. Gretchen and I have been doing this on our commercial flies for years, 30 years at least. And nobody's ever noticed or complained. And that is we're gonna trim this off longer than we normally would. I'm gonna exaggerate the point here. And it's probably a 16th long. It just hides back there. Nobody notices it. And when you put a drop of glue on, <clears throat> uh, when you put a drop of glue on, it just kind of grabs that little stub and it won't pull out. Makes it a lot more durable. You know, and, and the way we the way we glue these, I never glue on camera, but we just tilt it down like that so that we're able to then take up, I'll just use a pretend bodkin of glue and you drop it right there. And of course it runs down into the hackle. I'll get my thumb out of the way so you can see what we're talking about. 